Um, good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to this installment of Table Talk, a series of conversations with academics and writers um, who we admire, who write on human-animal relations with the Indian Animal Studies Collective. Um, I'm Susan Harris, and Anu Pandey, my co-host, is also here. The Indian Animal Studies Collective aims to bring together academics and writers who are working and writing on um, human-animal relations in India. Today, we are going to discuss um, a great essay by Mick Smith from Queen's University. The essay is called Disappearance, Earth, Ethics, and Apparently Insignificant Others. A lot of things in brackets in that title. Um, I thought we could begin the conversation by talking about the two uh, main strands or the two main impulses in the essay. One, which uh, I, I felt that you're writing against this kind of formalism or formal identification of, um, of species that matter, of animals that matter. And you're also trying to write against um, how species are identified, which ones go extinct and which ones we do notice. So maybe we, you, could, you could just introduce the essay to us. And oh, just one more thing. Uh, please feel free to ask a question at any point. Just raise a hand or uh, post the question in the chat box. Well, that's great. Um, thank, you for, thank you for inviting me. Um, for the second time, even though I didn't turn up the first time. <laughs> so that's very generous of you. Um, yes. Um, it's, uh, maybe I could just give, I'll, I'll give some general background to my background as to why this is kind of a, why the, why the book starts out, it starts out the way that it does. Um, and I guess part of it has always been, um, as you say, a problem I find with a kind of formalist, formalism in ethics, um, which tries to set up a kind of axiology, a kind of moral axiology, a system by which you know, we can um, adjudicate the ethical value that should be apportioned, you know, the moral standing that different species or members of different species might, might have. And I've always found that problematic because of my background, I think, in ecology. Um, so, this essay, I guess, plays off that background in ecology. Um, uh, I started out uh, far too long ago to really remember. Um, uh, now, doing, doing work actually on fungal ecology. Um, so I did a degree in ecology with Alistair Fitter, who's mentioned at the um, beginning of this paper. Um, uh, and I eventually gave that up because I didn't think it was particularly useful for saving, solving the world's problems, at least the, the fungi I was studying weren't. Um, but I've always had an interest in, in those kinds of relations, the kind of relations that, relationships that, that go beneath the surface that aren't um, obvious and that are very difficult to bring to attention, I think. So, uh, and the complexity of ecological relations has always made me think that the complexity of any environmental or animal ethics is always going to be it's always going to be more complicated than just dealing with humans and dealing with human situations is difficult enough um, but dealing with ecology um, in a sense we're dealing with everything so um, there's a way in which that makes the whole uh, attempt to produce an ethics um, very very difficult also I think there's been a real problem with um, not recognizing that that people's understandings of what's ethically valuable are not going to conform to a single model right um people actually find all kinds of different things valuable that other people don't so the idea that we could come up with one kind of universal framework by which we could kind of rightly apportion moral standing is a kind of Although it's a, a kind of classical way of going about things in um, in, in Western philosophy, it's it's highly problematic, and and those problems um, really came to the fore. I think when I started to study philosophy and just realised that very few of the theorists that were 
were, were writing then about environmental ethics, um, you don't actually seem to know very much about ecology at all, right? So, <laughs> um, so I think that's that's one of the um, those are, those are the kind of fundamental concerns underlying it. As you say, one of them then is a kind of rejection of this, or at least recognizing that the the role of formal ethics has to be something else other than declaring what's right or wrong for people to actually value um, because I don't think we can legislate about that and the formal the formal ethics really comes out of a kind of a legislative framework I think if you think about it sociologically that's where it's emerged from um, and then there's this huge gap in terms of um, explaining how it is we come to value different different beings different uh, species different ecologies, different uh, landscapes, uh, oceans, and so on. Um, and that seems to me is um, it's not dealt adequately by limiting um, it to a notion of a kind of formal argumentative structure by which we should be able to convince people that, you know, of the error of their past ways and then make sure that they all somehow agree with us, despite our differences in our uh, historical, cultural, um, uh, emotional background and uh, the different things, the way that different the world appears to us all um, radically differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, it, and one of the words that um, you work with is appearance um, through the three thinkers that you engage with. And uh, while I was reading the essay, I was thinking about, you know, I, I, I work with animal rights activists and for them, um, you know, the idea of the encounter is so important. Um, you know, the ethical response stems from encountering a situation or from an encounter with an animal. So how would, how would appearance um, be different from an encounter? Because an encounter could, easily be as random and as unstructured as appearance could be. Um, but it sometimes seems to me that perhaps encounter has, um, has could be more applied and um, have more ethical value than appearance, which maybe is a matter of sensibility yeah, I guess I'm thinking about appearance in a, in a very broad sense. Um, so there's a way in which you might, I mean, there's, there are several terms we might use for it. Another one might be an event, right? Um, and I guess if we use that term event, then there's a way in which that would link, um, let's just call it a happening. Um, back to a kind of phenomenological framework like like that of somebody like um, Heidegger for example right in which case the encounter or the event um, what, what's important about it I think is not that it's precisely not that in, in a way that it has to be um, that it can be formally structured that we could say that you know this is inevitably going to lead to some kind of ethic but rather the mode in which that is uh, um, the other being, let's say, another animal, or whether it's an encounter with a tree or a particular kind of ecology or landscape, those kinds of encounters, I think, the way in which things appear depend quite often on the way in which we are or are not, for example, open to appearance uh, and open to having an encounter. But there may be certain kinds of encounter that are, you know, that are, are difficult to ignore. Right. I mean, um, I don't know, an encounter where you have a, 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 a coyote or a wolf standing right in front of you is going to be very difficult to, to ignore in that kind of sense. But there are all kinds of ways in which appearance can happen in very subtle ways, too, I think, and change the way in which we feel about the world and our, our relations to it. And, and maybe we don't even realize at the time um, that that's something that's actually unfolding and only later do we realize that to use Heidegger's terminology again that in some ways this event has been inceptual right it isn't something we can even conceptualize 
as such. What it has done has been inceptual in the sense that it has changed the patterning of our lives so that certain differences now appear to us in terms of the way that we relate to and uh, value the um, beings around us. Um, but I'm, it's not that I'm against it in any sense. I don't think there's a I don't think there's a kind of an hard, hard and fast distinction between an encounter and an and appearance. Just that they, for me, the, talking about an appearance um, makes that link specifically with a more phenomenological approach. Because we're talking in a sense about what appears in the world. Um, uh, but then we're also having to talk in this paper too about what doesn't actually appear and how those ethics can then flow, those patterns, those changes can flow to um, other beings, other situations, um, uh, other um, events in ways that um, often happen beneath the surface of our uh, surface appearances of, of what happened. Um, again, I'm not sure if that, that makes sense. You know, I, I think I think often we do recognize a certain kind of an event that um, has a profound effect upon us that might be life changing, you know, I mean, maybe that might be and that seeing an animal in pain or something that might be one of those accounts, or it may be much more something much more subtle, like just sitting still in a place sometime and have uh, and just realizing the depth and movement of the stream in front of us, right, and the way in which the ripples move and change and the patterns alter over the stones, and just in a way um, recognizing the transformation of the world which we don't control, we're not, um, which we're a part of, and that our world is, you know, what appears to us is only a very small part of what appears to other beings to what appears in other ways, in other circumstances, at other times. So. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, because you work with um, Levinas's idea of the other and this such an emphasis on phenomenology, you don't seem concerned with, you know, like a lot of contemporary emphasis on um, decentering the human or any kind of, um, you know, like, post-humanist or any kind of non-anthropocentric um, impulse. So I'm wondering if this event is to unfold, are we to see ourselves as um, just one being among multiple beings? Um, or, or, is, or is it that the humanist impulse is unavoidable and we must work with that to uh, to see the actual disappearance of these vanishing others and then uh, formulate ethics based on that mm, but that's a really complicated question yeah, i don't know <laughs> how to straightforwardly answer 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 that but I'll, I'll try and um and maybe talk around it a little bit um so I am very interested in post-humanism uh, um, and I've written some stuff about it elsewhere um, and actually used the term a couple of times and but I'm a little uncomfortable with it um, uh, partly because the various forms of post-humanism that um, have come out of a lot of the new materialism seem to me to be problematic in, in all kinds of ways um, um, and I'm very critical of humanism as an ideology I think um, I think humanism as an ideology um, uh, it's so caught up with notions of progress and various other things right that, um, that are fundamentally have been fundamentally ecologically and socially damaging in so many respects. Um, so yeah, I'm really very interested in how to descent the humans. Um, and I've never, I think there's a, there's a way in which everything I write comes out of my experience somewhere. 
uh, and my, that experience is, you know, um, in part being a being with a certain kinds of characteristics. Not that I want to essentialize those characteristics or say that that's a necessary part of being human. I think we have to have a kind of non-essentialist understanding of that. Nonetheless, there are kind of limits to what I can see and what I can hear and, um, and severe, li um, severe limits to what I can smell because of a car accident I was in <laughs> many years ago where my sense of smell has almost entirely disappeared. So that's a sense that I really miss, right? So, um, um, uh, um, something you realize that you really miss if, you know, you, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're walking with a dog and see the way that the world for the dog is entirely like created of smells, right? And, <laughs> in a big, big way. Um, so, yes, I think there's certain ways in which we, it's impossible to escape from being human in a way, right? Um, and you know, we're writing and talking and using technology and various other things. So, um, so we, we have to take account of that. But I think we also have to decenter the specialness of humans in lots of ways as well. Um, and so, um, and so there might be a tendency, there is a tendency in Heidegger, for example, to always suggest that humans have a special role in the events that happen in the world. Um, for him, when he's writing, humans have this special role to, you know, what he terms and places them at being the shepherd of being, right? We have this, um, things appear to us in such a different way, and we have these other capacities that other species don't have that, Humans are a necessary part of understanding the world as a world. And I think that is mistaken. I think, you know, things happen in a massive diversity of ways to different species, to different beings, to whether or not they're animals or plants or, you know, I mean, Heidegger's very disdainful about rocks, but I don't want to be so disdainful about rocks, you know. Um, it's ways in which there's all kinds of interactions and relationships between um, non-essential things um, that appear to it, each other in very radically different ways, um, have material effects on the other in different ways that mean different things to each other in radical different ways. And there's a real problem with putting, you know, with Heidegger as reinstalling the human as somehow this kind of a almost godlike creature that. Um, that has this kind of capacity to see everything as, as a whole. Um, and I think that's a real trouble. I think that's a problem. We do tend to think, you know, we see the whole picture, right? And one of the ways to be sent to that, I think, especially through phenomenology, is, is the kind of work that people like Oxkill did, you know, where we actually just show that, you know, well, no, there are all kinds of different ways in which things appear to different species, whether they're ticks or, Deer or dogs or you know, trees, um, you know, um, but those kind of things. I think that kind of decentering is really important. And uh, um, whether we call it posthumanism or not, I don't know because I'm not really sure whether I ever liked the term postmodern, for example, whether, whether how that operated. It's um, often it. It's just a more, ex in some cases, it can be just a more extreme version of, of what came before, I think. Um, that still doesn't, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, this is a long answer. Um, um, and stop me if I'm talking too much. Um, the thing I've been recent, recently working a, um, on is, um, is, a, is a book that's coming out in, in Minnesota. With a, um, with one of my students um, um, next month, actually, and it's called um, Does the Earth Care? And so one of the ways I want to decenter things precisely is to stop asking questions about how should we care for the earth, right, in a way, and ask them more of what seems to me a question that just isn't possible to frame in a modern Western scientific kind of approach, which is, you know, does the earth care? Does the earth care what happens, right? Um, in what sense is care a part of the constitutive aspect of the earth and not just something that humans can do to care for other species? And, you know, I think very much that the earth, there's, there's ways to um, recognize that the earth can 
does. Not as a whole, though, not all the time, and not in every way towards every other being, towards humans all the time, but that caring is a constitutive part of, the, of what the Earth is. And, you know, human care is just one of those aspects of the Earth's care because we're part, part and parcel of the Earth. Sorry, Anna. Yeah, yeah Anna, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I was um, hoping to ask you about uh, is connected to Susan's last question and your response to it. And that is the term, um, the human as a category at all, which I find kind of problematic given the fact that the strict distinction that's made between the human and the others, the non-human be it in whatever form it may be. Um, if we think about the fact that the human body consists of millions of uh, microbes and bacteria and various kinds of things, how does one say this is the human and that's the other? We are mixed, we are, we are you know, can't be separated. And we've got all these microorganisms on us, within us. So what then is the human that one talks about? As, as you know, being capable of having a caring relationship, a relationship of love or attentiveness to other beings. What other beings, if all the beings are, you know, in us, with us, if they are us, actually. I wonder how you feel about that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, agree with that entirely. Yeah, so we are ecology, right? We are, in, we are ecological in the, in the very fundamental. We, we have, um, yeah, these microbiomes that, that um, were hugely diverse, well, unless we take lots of antibiotics, in which case we make them much more simple, but <laughs> yeah, there's, we have these kind of microbiomes, they're, they're a constitutive part of who we are, and they may alter our mood, they may alter our, um, the, what we can, can and can't perceive of the world around us, they, they, um, they have all kinds of effects on our health, and you know, and and so, yeah, there's no way to just point to something and say, oh, you know, that's, that's the human bit of me that's making these kind of decisions. Yes. It, uh, yeah. And so, so I think the, the, the drawing of hard and fast lines between humans and other species is, is um, well, it's a uh, philosophers have, you know, spent a very long time trying to do that. Right? <laughs> and we haven't really got much past the kind of um, level of the, uh, upright biped kind of <laughs> distinction, which is so e was so easily refuted. You know, with, you know um, it's not any kind any kind of definition that we want to give is is really only going to be a family resemblance kind of um, thing in a in a kind of Wittgensteinian kind of uh, understanding of it. Right? It's something something that overlaps with, and it, it doesn't have any core essence there. And I, and I think. Um, you know, the, the the more I think about it, um, perhaps it's just the older I get. I don't know. Um, the more it seems to me obvious that there are no essences, right? That there's no, there's no essential um, me. There's no essential human. There's no essential um, species, uh, nature, or whatever it might be. And that those those things can be handy ways of um, thinking about arranging things in some kinds of ways but they but then they're, they're not uh, an accurate um, understanding of our position in the relation all of us everything about us in, in a sense is relation it's just that the, some of the patterns that we have uh, are more or less persistent over time some of the patterns that we are are more or less persistent over time um, uh, and so you know we in some senses have Persistent patterns that go back for many years within our own individual lives, um, some of which are good for us, some of which are probably not good for us, right, in the way that we see the world. But, but those, just because something is persistent doesn't mean it's um, from an essential aspect of us. All our cells change every, you know, almost entirely <laughs> every seven years or something, our cell, body cells have changed. So, yeah, there's, and that's true about the relations we have with. You know, and what we, what we show of ourselves, and what other beings, how other beings appear to us, too. I think. 
Professor Rukmini, go ahead. Okay, so I'm hoping you can now see me and hear yep. me. Hi, Susan. Right. So um, I had um, uh, uh, two questions and also an anecdote. The anecdote just appeared in my head, uh, sprung up in my head as I was listening to your talk. And uh, it's about a, a, when I was doing field work in the Bengal villages and there were floods and then the floods went away eventually. And uh, I said to the to this farmer, uh, you know, now things are fine, aren't they? And he said to me, no, uh, you don't see what I see. Beneath the surface, the seawater has seeped into uh, the soil. And for many, many years, things will not grow again. And in saying that, he brought my attention to his knowledge of the invisible things that lay beneath the surface in the soil. And, uh, but he also made the point that nature gives and forgives. So even though he was blaming the government for not, you know, for not preventing the floods of human agency, he was also saying that what lies beneath the surface is, as I read him, was very, uh, you know, it, it was not something which would hate you for, do, for these acts of violence or would not hate the sea for these acts of violence, but would in the end give and forgive. Uh, so with, that's the anecdote and it just, when you were talking about beneath the surface, it came into my head. I have two questions. The first one is related to what Anu said, uh, and it's about appearance. Now, appearance, of course, has two meanings. One is that it springs up, it just appears, and you may not guess, you may not ever have access to its causes. The but the second notion of appearance is you know, Galilean, all appearances have weight and color a tool for, hum for the human species and movement and so on. And I was wondering whether we had been designed by nature uh, in a way that there were certain kinds of appearance that we were not intended to see except through our instruments. So we cannot look into our heads and count the number of words that we have there. We cannot look at many layers of processing that we have within ourselves that are not outside. So to take this to your example of the seal pup and people outraged at the cruelty to it. Supposing it's in that frame, instead of having a single seal, you had like a thousand seals or a million seals in that same space. Human beings cannot think at that scale and so would not be able to understand the, the emotional impact of that scale. And I'm wondering whether these design features of cognition are something we should take into account when we talk about microbes and so on, uh, because they are cognitively built into species, all species, not just the human. So that's the perceptual question. And the other one's very simple, which is, um, it's about post-colonial theory and kind of imagined communities. And I was wondering whether theory is like, um, feminism or Marxism or post-colonial theory are theories which have a kind of affinity to the types of non-utilitarian, um, uh, reductive and rational approaches that you are rejecting and an affinity to the kind of Levinasian, um, uh, the, the, paradigm that you're suggesting so that uh, there could be a natural alignment if we wanted to move to the political sphere or the ethical sphere between those kinds of theories uh, 
political theories and your own perspective on emotion and cognition. Okay, <laughs> again, I'm really, <laughs> I'm not quite sure where to, where to start. Um, maybe with your, with, with the, um, the anecdote, um, in, in a way, um, because perhaps that would link to the previous question and answer. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try and talk a bit about the appearance and the political aspects. Of things. Um, so that what the farmer says makes entire uh, yeah it makes complete sense to me in the the way that what we might tend to do, uh, and you can see this um, in some aspects of something like Gaia theory or something like that would be to anthropomorphize Earth itself, right? And say nature, oh, nature is gonna take revenge on us because of the terrible things that we've done. And you, we saw recently some stuff about COVID that was fairly similar to that kind of view, right? You know, that this is a, this is a come up and this is a payback from nature for the kind of things with the damage that we've done to the, the earth um, and the tendency there I think is from the western scientific point of view and the tendency that's there in say somebody like James Lovelock's own theorizing about his work is, is to say on the one hand he wants to keep the personalization of Gaia because it it, it offers a an easy way for people to situate themselves in relationship in relation to the earth uh, on the other hand, he wants to say science doesn't have anything to do with that. So Earth objectively can't possibly hate us, can't possibly um, love us, can't possibly care for us, can't possibly do any of those things. Um, and um, yet, in uh, a lot of in indigenous cultures, for example, and in um, the history of uh, Western thought itself too, there are cases in which people clearly have thought and do think that the earth does give. Um, but it still gives um, as it is a, it is what gives us the affordances and the allowances to be the kind of beings that we are. Um, it provides for us ecologically, although um, what it does might not be done with any intent or again done as a whole. Um, it's, it's nonetheless giving. <laughs> and so what I would like to say about that is that giving is something that um, certainly um, modern Western and, and, and scientific things have not, don't find room for, right? They, they, they can't, they cannot find room for recognizing the earth as giving. Um, in some sense. I think some bits of environmentalism, some bits of ecological thought, uh, many indigenous ways of thinking do definitely recognize that giving as a crucial way of relating to the world that we're a part of. Um, and that gratitude is a right, uh, a right way to um, recognize that, that we should be grateful. Um, so, I don't want to go too long. I think there's an, in terms of Western, in terms of Western, um, previous kind of models of uh, what I might call an imaginary, um, which would link the, uh, maybe Benedict Anderson's notion of, a, of a, an imaginary uh, as well, um, in terms of the um, notions of community that you, you mentioned. I think there's an imaginary of progress whereby we kind of shed that notion that, uh, that the earth is anything but some kind of an object that maybe comes out of Kant and philosophers like that, but also out of the social movements and everything that was happening um, in Europe at that time. So before that, there was an imaginary that was providential, that actually thought the earth was given by God, right, to put um, humans, again, this is a human-centered kind of view, but nonetheless, earth could be understood as providential and it provided all of these things and there's a whole, discourse in natural theology about the wonderful ways in which nature provides for humans 
um, because it's been set up that way by uh, by God. It's so the, the, the kind of a religious tradition, which is both anthropocentric in a in a very damaging way, but also at least recognizes there's a kind of notion in which the earth is what I would call provisional. But what I refer to in my later work is something called provisional ecology, by which I mean uh, ecology is provisional in the ways, the multiple ways in which it provides for inhabitation of the earth by all kinds of different beings and different, um, that in, it's also provisional in the sense that it's temporary. It's never fixed or permanent, it's never guaranteed, it's not, it's not providential in the way that um, maybe the providential imaginary might have understood it. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's giving all the time, um, you know, when we're part of that giving. Um, and I've only got to do the anecdote now. <laughs> so, yeah, and so that, thinking in terms of those imaginaries, um, it's um, quite definitely indebted to Benedict Anderson's work on imagined communities, for example, which I think is a really important, um, really important work. And I think some of his politics, politics too is uh, something that feeds into the way that I would uh, think about the, the world as well. Um, so yes, I think, I mean, my, I don't want to hop on about my own kind of hip background, but when I, when I started with a very scientific background, the first thing that I was told as an ecologist as a scientist was forget all the politics, it's not about that. It's about doing mathematical models of the world and the way it works. And it's, all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all doing the math, right? And I was never very good at math, but the reason most of my friends and I got into environmental stuff was precisely for the politics, right? Because we liked the, it was very critical of the way the world was going at that time. And, um, and so I think there are things there. I tend to think that Marxism tends to be, historically has been incredibly humanist. In its approaches towards things and there's been a long although there have been Marxists who have um, engaged with issues in animal ethics and in environmental ethics there's also been a very long history of um, dismissal, dismissal of environmental movements and um, a characterization of it all as a kind of uh, all environmentalists, uh, wilderness freaks, or something like that, right? And mm. I don't have any social concerns, and, uh, you know, and, so and that's just, um, it's an incredibly partial reading of environmentalism, and it's creating a kind of, it's created a straw environmentalist who has no, none of those um, social concerns, uh, and isn't is supposedly completely unaware of all of the theoretical developments in the uh, in sociology and political theory and so on. You know, um, um, I taught in the social sociology department for you know 15 years or something, right? And so it's 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 um, it's not that uh, I think that environmentalists are unaware of those things, or well, some of them are. Don't get me wrong, some of them are, but but, but I think um, I think there's you have to be careful about just assuming or falling back into a, another paradigm, which to be honest, has had very little space for a notion of a giving nature and where the soul, um, soul movement principle of action has been human labor, um, human activity on the world. And so I find that um, there's become some core tenets of Marxism, though I appreciate very much its critique of capitalism. Uh, I don't find much to criticize with that. <laughs> there's, there's a problem with this notion that it has been very humanist, I think, in many of its, um, many of its formats. Um, Can you say something about the perceptual question, which is that species are constrained or designed? You know, we, it's, imagine if we didn't have all these instruments and this is a species which is obsessively tool using and tool inventing but supposing you didn't have 
those tools, we would not know of microbes and pseudopodia and all sorts of things. We just would know about it. But the designs of giving and, uh, you know, sort of interlocking designs would still exist. So in that sense, what I'm asking is, uh, you know, scale and uh, penetration matters. We can see what we see very dimly through a glass darkly, the, 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 you know, the intricacies, but we will never grasp all of it because it's so intricate. Meanwhile, species may be disappearing, but we wouldn't have known that without our instruments. So uh, what I'm asking is really cognitively has nature made all species blind in some senses because it's good for you or good for all species to be blind to certain levels of scale. I mean, I won't pursue this point. I'm just wanting to make yeah. it. Yeah, well, I think, yes, all species have kind of limits on what they can, obviously what they, what appears to be in a yeah. way, yeah. And, and, and so that, that that's, that's clearly the case and it's clearly the case with humans too. And yes, you're absolutely right. I think there's, um, as I mentioned in the paper, you know, before people even come up with a microscope, then this that reveals whole, even a minor, you know, 10 times magnification suddenly reveals the whole world that, we were totally um, ignorant of beforehand, and and in some senses, it's an, a hugely enlightening and an amazing thing, and um, fascinating, right? In in so many ways. Um, in other ways, it's been encompassed within a view that somehow um, technological mode of appropriating the world is somehow giving us an entire world picture in its completeness and. And so we might get um, somebody like E.O. Wilson or so on who um, suggested that we all we need is what science is providing us with all of these jigsaw pieces and what we need to do is just fit them together and then we'll have this whole picture of the world, world as a whole. And um, I think what it, what it could have done is show us how ignorant we are really about all kinds of things and, and how humble we ought to be actually about the levels of uh, knowledge that we have and uh, and how there's still mysteries, right? It's not like everything is, <laughs> or, um, I mean, you're thinking even in terms of cosmology or something, you know, um, you know, for some, some cosmologists, they'll say, you know, well, we'll see, soon know the mind of God or something, right? We'll have a, this whole picture of other, but in other ways of um, thinking and what ones we should have is we really I think is is more a recognition that this shows us how little we know and what a little part of the universe we are and how um how decentered we actually are from from everything and um and that kind of uh, humility I think is kind of crucial to the way that we approach things and not think about um technologically of framing the world in such a way that um, we tend to make it something that we can control and alter and manipulate and um, that somehow what we will do will be count as, as progress. And um, this is a really difficult situation we're, we're in now with climate, climate change. And, um, if everything, if, if this is what, you know, science technology has led to climate change, um, it's very difficult to see that as a as a matter of progress. Um, but the situation in in, um, uh, in the Ukraine at the moment, you know, and um, we have this kind of myth of progress, you know, continual progress to where we don't really know, right? But, you know, if everything there turns into a third world war, it's going to be very difficult to see how anyone could come up with a kind of uh, a view of progress as being a, 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 being a good thing, right? <laughs> um, so, so I think, so I think rather than living in an imaginary of that, the kind of technologically framed progress, uh, we need a different way of understanding or different ways in the plural of understanding um, who and what we are and how we relate to the earth and, you know, 
that's what I would say provisional ecologies do. They, they show you know, it's a way of recognizing um, the limits and the provisionality and the temporality of our knowledge and understanding of things. Uh, and yet, the, what, yeah, still recognizing the wonder of those things, I think. Um, Again, thank, I you. thank you. Thank um, you. Just wanted to say that, you know, I just read that Ukraine was um, the work the bread basket because of the nature of its soil for all of Europe and the world. So it's going to have knockdown effects on human mm -hmm. hunger very soon. Anyway, I thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to, before we get to Anu's question, I wanted to follow up on what we were just discussing. And um, it's, it, you do mention Oog School and the Umwelt briefly in this essay. And uh, one of the things that I've always uh, felt while reading Oog School is that while I totally understand and um, feel for how he describes the, the infinite umwelts around us, I've al also wondered um, how, how wh what possibilities there are between the different umwelts and how communication can happen um, between these different perceptual worlds. And, um, and, and I think maybe in the essay, the, um, the, other, the other, when the other response or when we see the other responding that happens. And um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit on how communication between the different perceptual worlds can happen and if there is a space for um, in uh, human communication through mediums like literature uh, to make that happen through these imagined encounters um, because there's only so much that one can actually if one can actually perceptually see then we must turn to um, perceptual worlds in text, in languages, or in modes that humans understand to make those things appear or make those other worlds visible. It's a sense, I guess, in which we live in imaginary worlds all the time. Right? In the, in the, um, you know, even the brain, way our brain works, um, we're not constantly aware of everything around the way in which you know the um, sometimes um, we might walk into a room and, and and just assume that everything's in its normal place and and that's the kind of picture that we think we inhabit but then something will suddenly stand out as being not where we expected it to be and then our attention will shift to that and we'll realize that things have altered and, then, uh, and so it's not like we can hold everything in front of us all the time, in front of our consciousness, in front of our percept, you know, the perceptions that we have of the world, that, or that we actually inhabit the world in that way. In a, in a sense, we live in a kind of a an imaginary world that's constituted through the kinds of relationships that we have uh, with it. In a sense, sense potential sense possibilities that we have, right? To to, to, to um, feel and touch and care. Um, the, and so on. So, so imagination is really crucial in all kinds of ways, um, and, and not in a way that's going to, you know, conflict straightforward with something called reality or something. But rather that our realities are always partly imagined. I think, um, in, at all kinds of levels. Um, so yes, I think literature is really important in terms of ways of, of changing. That of, of making it aware as aware sometimes, although then it, it might only be a temporary effect of uh, things that connections that we weren't aware of before, or um, or that connections we thought were there aren't there. Uh, um, but you know, when we think a certain species might be um, responding to us, um, it isn't actually. So. Um, and then the way that later we come to kind of an awareness of that. So there's a nice 
story by um, Robert McFarlane, who's a kind of uh, often referred to as a kind of nature writer, who I really like. Um, where he, and uh, he talks about um, this crazy expedition he had to go and um, uh, go and see some wall paintings on, on caves on the Lofoten Islands and off the coast of um, Norway in midwinter, where he climbs up uh, this pass and um, falls the crevasse part way up, and then he just manages to get out of it and struggles. He's by himself in it, you know, and uh, after this immense struggle against uh, you know all odds, he gets to the top of the pass and the snow, and and suddenly this eagle appears right in the sky above him. Right. And he's just, you know, like, oh, this is amazing. Like, you know, this is what an amazing thing. This is a huge event. Like, um, like, uh, just at the moment when he, you know, most wanted the affirmation of his life, as it were, right? This eagle appears above him, flying above him. And then he just stops and thinks for a second, and then he just starts to laugh because he realizes that the eagle's been watching him struggle up there. And the eagle's actually thinking, hey, that's my dinner just gone. It's just made it to the top. <laughs> the eagle thought, <laughs> was only interested in him as a potential food source, right? And, and so there's a disconnect between what we would like to think of ourselves as being central here. And in some ways, you know, the other animal is responding to what we do and, uh, and really what's happened. That doesn't mean that they don't respond. It, it, and evolutionarily, of course, they have responded in, in all kinds of ways with each other. Um, uh, and there's a whole four and a half billion year history of the, the Earth, right? That has, in some senses, led to that moment. <laughs> in other senses, that's just a moment um, where somebody's misunderstood their relationship to the, to the world around them and the thought that it was aimed at them when it you know, um, it wasn't aimed at them. If it was, it wasn't in the sense that they, they, they thought <laughs> it was a, some symbol of achievement. You know, it's, uh, it's something very different. And, uh, and that's why I like his writing, because he's really able to puncture his own, um, you know, he didn't leave it there. He just, uh, and, and to find a sense of humor in that, right? That, that that's the way we inhabit the world in a sense. Um, yeah, we, of course we have these encounters. Um, it, encounters are never really on the terms that we think they are. We're never fully aware of the of what's going on, of why they um, why the encounter happens in the way that they that it did. Um, and yeah, with the Oxkill, um, you might Jojo um, Gambin uh, refers to this as well in one of his works. It's just the way in which. For example, the spider and the fly, the spider building its webs is really not aware of the fly, right? In the sense their existences are, you know, they pass each other by. The fly, because of evolution, the spider has woven its web with just a kind of gap inside of it that catches a certain kind of size of fly, uh, which is, and the gap, the, the gap between the where between the strands of the web is it exactly that kind of on that marginal level where the fly's eye can or maybe will or maybe won't determine that there's a web there and fly out of the way and so this co-evolution has happened and so even though they don't you know they don't live in optical terms in the same phenomenological bubble there are ways in which those phenomenological bubbles are in constant um, communication with each other um, um, they don't, you know, their existence in a sense, they may not appear to each other uh, in any visual sense at all until the fly, you know, hits the, net, the web and gets caught. I don't know if that makes sense. So I think there's all kinds of stuff going on behind, behind what we um, do. And, you know, ecology is all composed of that stuff. And I think evolution is composed of that stuff too. It's, it's composed of those... Um, those little um, gaps in our perception and um, uh, that are necessary parts of being able to, to exist in the world. Like we can't take everything in all of the time. Um, and maybe this, this, this goes back to the previous um, point too. And we can't take every, if we can't take everything in all of the time, then 
there's a way in which what the ancient Greek would have called, I suppose, like kind of a crazy, a kind of a, a kind of a, like a ethically, we can never take everything in at the same time either. You know, we're always going to be focused on some things rather than others, and there are always implications of that. You know, um, that means that some beings are not going to be treated ethically or recognized um, because of our circumstances, because of the way we think the world is composed. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, Renu, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Susan. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, so uh, my, my, my question is, uh, I, I just want to know your comment about this, about the, uh, you know, uh, encounter or appearance or the event of animals on media, especially the new media uh, narratives, you know, I'm curious to know your answer. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a sense in which everything we do is mediated, right? Um, uh, whether it's technologically mediated or, or, or not. And, and so I think you know there's there's no no definite reason why um, images and so on that you see through technology um, need have less impact on people than the images that we have in our actual you know call it physical encounters with the the world around us um, often um, and perhaps especially over the last while when people have been um, kind of very isolated in some ways and um, uh, you can see that in terms of the you know the certain social media and so on then I think those images can be um, uh, fundamentally important in changing people's ways of thinking about things but often in ways that don't conform with actually the, <laughs> what the rest of the world outside the internet is actually like and is, is going on. Um, um, I don't, I don't do social media. I don't do Facebook, Twitter, any of it. I don't um, involve myself in it. I don't. Um, yes, a Zoom meeting is about as far as I go with anything because at least here we can talk and talk as if it's like a um, a community where we can see each other's faces and and um, but also we can. Um, recognize certain modes of communicating rather than getting kind of like uh, I don't know people who are hide, hiding behind um, uh, pseudonyms or trolling people or doing various other things right and I, I, I'm afraid I think a lot of the social media stuff I know, I know a lot of people have found it kind of a, a, a lifesaver in a way right in the in uh, times when face-to-face -face contact has not been so um, possible, I think it, I think it's been, uh, in many respects, highly damaging. So um, and addictive, of course. So it's, uh, um, so no, you can. I, I still rely on technology, but it's kind of a hyper technology or whatever it might be a lot of the time. And, um, I'm not a good person to ask about the effect on, I'm sorry, of, of, like, of social media because I spend so little time, if any, actually on it. <laughs> I, I, just, I just have one last question before we wrap it up, um, which is, you know, uh, to see other beings or animals or any other kind of creatures it, as um, bearers of their own significance, uh, would it be possible in already existing relationships and or would they have to be encounters or events involving new creatures or new beings because um, often I've I've heard people speak about and this is maybe just about animals that this is just a dog or this is just a cat because they're certain about the position of that um, being 
in their worldview. So could the um, could that being a break out of that fixed position that we ascribe to them um, if we are to see them differently, would that be possible? I think it always is possible, yes. I think it's always possible to do that. Um, and I think that, again, is, is part of one of the problems with maybe an over-formalized version of ethics that it makes it more difficult do that um, in that we might just say, oh, well, that's a cat, we know what that is, or that's a you know, dog, and we understand what dogs are about. And um, but I think, yeah, um, there's all kinds of ways in which um, happenings, if you want to call them that, um, change our perspective on even people we thought we knew intimately, for example, right? Um, things that suddenly, um, uh, we realize about someone we thought we knew kind of inside out and you recognize well that's not the case and we didn't and um, and I guess that's why I like um, I like Levinas and I like the kind of a that comes out of that more of what we might call a difference ethics right in the sense that there's always this recognition of an incompleteness of a gap of a non-fixity of you know with Levinas of uh, what he refers to as saying rather than the said you know the said is a kind of fixed aspect of something but saying is very much the kind of lively creative the 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 happening event kind of as it were aspect of the of our use of language and um but yes somebody can always say something that surprises us or uh, creatures always do things that surprise us all of the time right and people do um and sometimes it's not a nice surprise, right? <laughs> but, but um, yeah, it's, I think it's, sometimes we don't recognize when that's happening because we're very caught up in a particular pattern of thinking ourselves, right? Um, something is sedimented, you know, and we can't live in complete chaos all the time where everything changes all the time everywhere. You know, we have to have sedimented patterns of, you know, relatively sedimented patterns of thinking just and being in certain ways to get a certain level of comfortableness. But that comfort can also easily swing over into something becoming more con concrete. And, um, um, and hence, I guess, the kind of uh, rather grass attempt at a kind of a, a way of talking about um, ethics, how ethics percolates through soils and, and into the streams and, and so on in, in some ways as different from a kind of channeled, you know, concrete channeled kind of irrigation kind of way of understanding that, that ethics might might work. Um, yeah, I don't know if that... Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, thanks everyone, it's an hour. It was so lovely to talk to you and meet you finally. Um, thanks for a wonderful conversation and thanks everyone for being here. It's been so great. Thank you, Mick. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it's been really, really enjoyable. Thank you. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to um, chat more, then, then uh, please do. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to send okay. emails backwards and forwards. So uh, that's again, that, that's a kind of social media. I'll do things on. <laughs> Bye, everyone.